Let me pray. God, again, what a, a humbling reality to be uh, cared for by you, to be uh, adopted by you, that we get to call you Father and to be welcomed as your own children. And just to think again about the, the way that you care so well for us in your instruction, your sufficient scriptures given to us to edify, encourage, sustain uh, weary souls, to give us clarity and help us to see the world rightly. And God, we get to open your word now again, and we get to behold our Savior. We get to run back to him to be refreshed and refilled. God, I ask that you would do that very thing through the preaching of your word, that you would be honored and that you would be pleased to sanctify our living through the next few moments. And we ask all this for Christ's sake. Amen. You've probably heard the word shalom. It's a, a common, uh, useful biblical word. And that word had actually become quite popular in the past century or so, uh, from the late 20th, early 21st century, because of the social justice movement uh, in various iterations throughout a couple of, a few di different generations, the word shalom has been unfortunately taken and misappropriated by Christians who believe that the church has uh, not only a responsibility to proclaim the truth, uh, to train up souls to grow in godliness in the, in the spiritual realm, but also to create and redeem culture, to uh, take up some sort of social justice mandate to uh, promote and establish and ensure human flourishing and those kinds of things. And so a good biblical word uh, has been often misunderstood, shalom. Well, the, the word just at its, at its most basic meaning means peace. It's a, a great word uh, full of uh, substance and, and depth when you look at where it occurs in Scripture. And depending on the context, the word can simply mean peace or something like welfare or a desire for well-being. It can mean an absence of war at times. Uh, so peace, just taking on all of those various facets, this is, is actually a, a good biblical word. Uh, and it often accompanies ideas such as God's favor or man's favor, earthly prosperity even in some contexts. Uh, in, in other contexts, it speaks to a comprehensive, general societal ease or good fortune happening, coming upon a people. And so the, the multifaceted uh, nature of this word, just taking on various shades of nuance, but it is a, a thoroughly biblical word, uh, one that we shouldn't shy away from. Uh, and, and as I mentioned, unfortunately, it's come to be used by those who are seeking to establish something like a kingdom on earth, God's kingdom on earth, uh, to establish shalom or to usher in shalom or bring about shalom or promote shalom. Um, you know, it's a, it's a Hebrew word, so it does sound cooler if you can say, you know, the Hebrew but it's unfortunately so misunderstood. Uh, people who take a, what's called holistic gospel approach to meet not only the spiritual needs of man, but the physical needs of man. And they've seen that as a sort of a dual responsibility of God's church to transform the world spiritually by preaching the gospel, calling men to be saved and to repent 
on one hand, and then to also transform the world to redeem or renew, see the world renewed in an earthly, temporal, uh, material realm, as it were. And so they call that, this is a, a holistic approach to the gospel. Um, it's a, 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 a whole gospel. That, that term has been used, the full gospel, a whole gospel, to describe other sinister errors as well, right? The full gospel, uh, that there's a, a church in New Orleans right next door to where I went to high school, where we'll be meeting in just a few weeks from now. They pride themselves on being a, the, the place where the full gospel movement was pioneered. And so what they mean by that is Jesus uh, loves you, has a wonderful plan for your life spiritually, and so he gives you the way to eternal life, and he wants you to have the abundant life. That means beyond just the spiritual good, but also earthly health and prosperity and wealth and riches. So the, the full gospel, the whole gospel has appeared in various forms, not just in what's popular in the uh, so-called social justice or woke movement. But this is where the, the term shalom has gotten thrown around in an unfortunate way. Uh, Joel James, who's been here before, uh, he and uh, another pastor, Brian Biedeback, they write this in their essay, Regaining Our Focus, a response to the social action trend and evangelical missions, they say this, quote, social justice advocates are fond of describing the gospel in terms of human flourishing. The incarnation, they say, was about Christ bringing shalom or general well-being to the human race. Many evangelicals, without turning away from substitutionary atonement, have adopted this notion enthusiastically. If the gospel is about human flourishing, then any Christian effort that increases that flourishing is gospel ministry. On that basis, building a hospital or an orphanage is just as much a fulfillment of the Great Commission as church planting. End quote. And so they're addressing in that particular essay the unfortunate effects that that social justice movement has had in missions. Uh, and both of those men uh, having served in Africa, Joe James still being there in Pretoria, uh, are well aware of the, the pitfalls and the dangers, the, the ways that that movement has ensnared those people in, in, in Africa. Even when many read the Bible, they open the Bible and they come to the prophets where we are tonight in the book of Zephaniah, and they would see in Zephaniah or the other prophets in the Old Testament this push to overturn unjust systems, to right social ills. And Walt Kaiser, I think, helpfully, uh, you know, he saw this in the early 80s, and he had this to say when he addressed in his book on preaching and teaching the Old Testament, he addressed how we ought to view the, the Old Testament prophets and how we shouldn't. So while this, you know, was still a, a thing in the 80s, here's what Walt Kaiser said writing to those who would faithfully handle the Old Testament prophets. He says, the Old Testament prophets did not make their primary appeal to the structures or institutions of their society, but to the individuals who made up those communities and institutions. What is more, the lever they proposed to cause a revolutionary turnabout was the word of God itself, rather than direct sociological tinkering or political agitation. Thus, the Old Testament prophets were revolutionaries who did indeed hate with a passion 
every form of oppression, injustice, and unrighteousness. But they view these ills as being mere symptoms of deeper spiritual problems which cried out for each individual to respond to the declared word of God. And that is very much in keeping with what you see in the New Testament. The apostles don't, nor did Jesus, address or speak to the so-called institutions or systems of the day. But they did speak to those who ruled those unjust, oppressive systems. You remember Jesus addressing the Pharisees over and over again. Those who were devour widows' houses and took advantage of orphans. People who were supposed to be cared for by the nation of Israel, by the citizens in that nation, were rather taken advantage of and children were being told to give what was due to their parents to the hypocritical religious leaders. This is Corbin. This is given to God. So I don't have to honor mom and dad in their old age. You'll have to find some other means of caring for you because I've done the more spiritual thing of giving my money to the temple. Or widows who had their last who were supposed to be taken care of and given charity, they instead were told that they should give their last, and that was somehow more spiritual than caring for yourself and uh, ensuring you could live to, to see another day. That kind of his hypocrisy, Jesus certainly did have strong words for those people. But he addressed the people <laughs> And their specific injustice, John the Baptist called those same men to repent, right? So they went city to city, town to town, calling men and women to repent, not seeking through some political uh, stratagem to overturn the ills while repentance and the gospel can catch up later. People can repent later after the system has been overturned. And you'll remember the enemies of the gospel said that very thing about the apostles. The apostles were so effective in their evangelism, in their missionary endeavors, that the enemies of the gospel said they have turned the world upside down. So their just preach the gospel approach worked. At least the enemies of the cross thought so. And today we find ourselves in a place where the friends, children of the, of the cross oppose that idea and, and do not say the same thing. Uh, tonight we're continuing the 66 book series for Zephaniah. So why am I, I talking about this very thing? Um, a couple reasons. One, because I've already given you the introduction to Zephaniah. Some of you weren't, weren't here for that, but this year, uh, preached through the book of Zephaniah in evening services. Uh, so those nine sermons are available to you on the website. And while I do want to uh, review what Zephaniah is about so that whether you were here uh, earlier this year and heard that series or not, you will be very clear about what Zephaniah is all about, what God is intending for his original audience as well as for us, current readers and hearers of that book, everybody will be clear, Lord willing, on what the purpose of that book is and how it's useful to us. But beyond that, what I did think would be uh, helpful and uh, hopefully a joy is to have our confidence uh, solidified, reestablished and strengthened through looking to Zephaniah again and its relevance for what's happening in the current day. You know, we, this is probably, you've probably come, if, if I'm guessing, to evening services recently as we've been in the Minor Prophets and just repeatedly had your understanding opened <laughs> And your mind sort of blown like, wow, I didn't 
know all of that was there or had no idea what that book was about, I need to go read that again. I've had that impression. <laughs> and so this will actually be helpful for us to not only see what the book is about, but I think to see its modern day relevance. So just looking at Zephaniah, open up again to, to that book. The way that I like to summarize this, this message is that Zephaniah prophesied that only a humble, faithful remnant would escape the universal destruction of the day of Yahweh, the day of the Lord, and experience its unparalleled blessing. It's a simple message. This is a three-chapter book, really singular in its focus, and he just keeps talking about the day, the day, the day, the day. And what we find out from the beginning of the book, we start to encounter this description of the day. You'll notice in verse 7, of chapter 1 in Zephaniah, be silent before the Lord Yahweh, for the day of Yahweh is near. And he goes into, he launches into a description in vivid detail of the day of the Lord. This is like the day of the Lord 4K in Zephaniah. But then by the time you get to the end of the book, he still has in mind the same day. Just notice chapter 3, verse 16, for example. In that day, it will be said to Jerusalem, Do not fear, O Zion. Do not let your hands fall limp. Yahweh your God is in your midst, the mighty one who will save. He will be joyful over you with gladness. He will quiet you in his love. He will rejoice over you with singing, joyful singing. Even uh, another reference, verse 19, at that time. So you have a time marker, sort of a phrase that refers to a specific time. I am going to deal with those who afflict you, so on and so forth. And so from chapter 1 to chapter 3, you really have the same day in view. Like Zephaniah is focusing on a singular period of time, day, a single era if you will. And the, one of the questions that gets debated about this book is, well, is it a single day? Is it a 24-hour period? Is it a, a period of time? If you follow the events that occur, um, it can hardly be a 24-hour period of time, um, not only with the internal evidence in Zephaniah, but the events that happen within Zephaniah seem to indicate that it's more than just a single day, but a period of time. But as well as when you add to what Zephaniah is saying, what the rest of the prophets and previous revelation contribute, right? You can read your Bible that way. What comes before? What, what does this prophet know that he is building on? What revelation came before that prophet that he's adding to? And really what all of the scriptures are, are aiming at, the terminating point, is the kingdom that doesn't end, right? So every patriarch has been waiting on this. Uh, Enoch talked about the Lord coming with all of his holy ones uh, in judgment, when he would remove the evil from the earth, the wicked from the earth. Abraham was told that kings would come from him, he would inherit land, that he would have an obedient seed and a singular one of them would be the king to reign over the land that Abraham and his faithful seed inherited. And so God would have to perform a resurrection to make all of those promises come to fruition. But the promises would be given in what gets described as a kingdom. There's a king, there's an obedient group of, of people, subjects. They all believe and worship the king together. And they've all been raised from the dust of the earth to do so. And so what, 
gets the picture that gets painted leading up to Zephaniah is this kingdom where eternal life is inherited. God himself dwells among men. Israel is his people. The capital of the world is Jerusalem and the king reigns from a rebuilt temple there. That's what they're all aiming at. And so it would not be confusing to Zephaniah's audience to be hearing about this day when the king, Yahweh, the king, dwells in their midst, they know this isn't a 24-hour period. This is an, an age that's in view. And it's not until later in Revelation when that gets a specific time limit on it, a thousand years. And so this day begins in Zephaniah 1, and it's got two phases. There's two phases of the day of the Lord. There's the phase that all of creation, all of history has been aiming at when God rules among men as a man. He does what Adam couldn't do faithfully, what Adam failed at. He fulfills that, subdues creation, reigns with his people, perfectly exercising dominion over the creation. That's where it ends. So that's where Zephaniah ends. But that's the second phase. That's the last phase. That's the unparalleled blessing that's coming to all of those who believe. Where Zephaniah begins this first phase of the day of the Lord is nothing like that. It's universal destruction. And so if you look again at chapter 1, the prophet Zephaniah, whose name means Yahweh hides, we'll get to why that's a fitting He's a fitting prophet to write this book in just a second. But where this prophet Zephaniah begins is verse 2. This word of Yahweh came to Zephaniah, and here's what the word says. I will completely end all things from the face of the ground, declares Yahweh. I will end man and beast I will end the birds of the sky and the fish of the sea and the ruins along with the wicked. And I will cut off man from the face of the ground, declares Yahweh. So I will stretch my hand against Judah and against all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And I will cut off the remnant of Baal from this place. And the names of the idolatrous priests along with the priests and all who worship on the housetops, the host of heaven, and those who worship and swear to Yahweh and yet swear by Milcom, and those who have turned back from following Yahweh, and those who have sought Yahweh or inquired of him. This is a strong statement about what God intends in removing the wicked from the earth. He's going to ruin the world to do it. And so the complete end begins in verse 2 to be described. Everything from the face of the earth, the ground, this includes man and beast, birds of the sky, fish of the sea, ruins along with the wicked. Everything from the face of the ground. Um, As we've noted before, this is, notice where he begins. This is man, beast, birds, fish. And then the things that are ruined. This is, if you looked at the days of creation, things were created, fish first, birds next, beast, then man. And so but by him naming those things in reverse order, he's describing not creation as it first occurred, but the reversal of creation. God is in this judgment undoing creation. And so he lists those things in literary form, in reverse, to make the point. This is his stretching of his hand against Judah. Same language used in the Exodus when Moses literally stretched out his staff. The next plague came when he did so at God's command. And God used this same language of him stretching out his hand against the Egyptians, against his enemies. And so he brought about these destructive plagues. On this day, 
This is the, the imagery. This is the, the reality that God will be stretching his hand out against the world to ruin it. And so this is the first phase, the universal destruction of the world. Everything gets affected. Absolutely everything. Nothing escapes the wrath of God, the judgment of God, when the day of the Lord comes. Nothing. No one, no beast, no bird, no fish, nothing that's ruined in the world is unaffected. And so the point here is, you don't want to be here when this comes. You don't want to be here when the day of the Lord arrives. You do want to be here at the end of the day of the Lord, or the second phase gets ushered in. The second phase is chapter 3, universal, unparalleled blessing, where the king's reigning in the midst of his people, earth is restored. Uh, as, as we've uh, been able to do some traveling over the past couple years, and I've gotten to see the beauty that has resulted from God's judgment, uh, places like the Grand Tetons, in Wyoming or the Grand Canyon, these beautiful mountain ranges, a beautiful picturesque canyon, those are not a part of the original creation. That is the result of an earthwide, a worldwide flood <laughs> and the seismic activity that happened in it. And now we go visit these places and go, wow, what's going to be the beauty left in the wake of the day of the Lord? I don't know. It'll be something to behold. You want to be there, a tourist on that day. And so chapter 1 describes the destruction. Chapter 3 describes what's coming. And so the natural question becomes, how do I escape chapter 1 and experience chapter 3? How do I escape the universal destruction and experience the unparalleled blessing? And the answer to that question is found in chapter 2. How do you get from chapter 1 to chapter 3? Answer, chapter 2. Look at verse 1 in chapter 2. Gather yourselves together indeed. Gather, O nation, without shame, before the decree takes effect. The day passes like the chaff before the burning anger of Yahweh comes upon you, before the day of Yahweh's anger comes upon you. What's, what is there to do? Verse 3, seek the Lord. Seek him. Seek Yahweh, all you humble of the land who have worked his justice. Seek righteousness. Seek humility. And perhaps, just perhaps, you will be hidden in the day of Yahweh's anger. The prophet, whose name means Yahweh hides, tells the people of God how to be hidden. You want to be hidden on the day of God's judgment? Here I am, Yahweh hides, telling you how to be hidden, how to escape the wrath that's coming. And this is the answer. You see it in, in verse 3. Perhaps you will be hidden. That perhaps is a, a, a word in the Hebrew that is like a hopeful anticipation, almost with this air of it's going to happen and I'm hopeful, <laughs> looking forward to it, anticipating, longing to see it occur. So what Sarah said when she encouraged her husband to have a son by Hagar, perhaps I will have a son on her, by, by her. She's in longing, hopeful anticipation wanting her husband to impregnate another woman to have a, a son. Well, it's the same word used here. Perhaps you will be hidden, this hopeful anticipation. When? In the day. In the day. Specifically when God's anger arrives. So when that day comes and his anger with it, you'll be hidden, put away for safekeeping, I haven't studied every passage in the Old Testament with the, the same level of depth that I've looked at this one, but this might be as close as you come to a rapture in the Old Testament. 
it'd be uh, anachronistic to read that into Zephaniah because it doesn't say anything about a catching away, right? The, the term rapture meaning to be snatched away. That's not the word here. So to call this the rapture would be wrong, would be an error. But the idea that when the day of the Lord comes, somehow, some way, God rescues his people from the destruction that's coming. And then somehow, some way, what's left of his people, the, the believing portion of them, the remnant, show up in chapter 3 in the kingdom. Theologically, that's happening here in this passage. And so just your, your eschatology, uh, Zephaniah so helpfully just in stages lays it out for us. There's universal destruction coming chapter 1, as well as unparalleled blessing coming chapter 3 in the kingdom. The way that you avoid, escape, be hidden from the destruction and lay hold of the blessings is to be hidden by God. And, and what must someone do? Well, the one who would enter into the kingdom and avoid God's coming wrath, he must obey these instructions. Gather yourself, verse 1. This nation that had no shame, he, they're being called as a matter of urgency. Notice in verse 2, before the decree, before the burning anger, before the day. Hurry up. He's already told us in chapter 1, the day is near. So hurry up. It's coming. It's close. It's imminent. How close? I don't know. Zephaniah's audience didn't know. Zephaniah didn't know, it seems. And so the urgency, the stress is on the urgency because of the mystery of it all. You don't know when it's coming. It could come at any moment. Hurry up and humble yourselves. Gather yourselves. Get your life into order. And do what? Verse 3, seek Yahweh. I mean, is that so awful? You want to avoid God's wrath? Then just seek him. Pursue him. Desire him. Align your heart with his. Right? Anybody who was willing to heed these instructions had to believe chapter 1. This would have been a response that only could have proceeded from faith. He's not calling them to be saved by works. You understand? Hey, you believe what I'm saying? Then do what faith demands. Seek the Lord. You have faith? Be faithful is the idea. And he could boldly, unashamedly call them to this. Why? Because this was only going to be accomplished, verse 3, by the humble, the humble. Same word Jesus picks up, picks up on. In Matthew 5, let me just remind you, in the Beatitudes, that same language used by Christ, all you humble of the earth or the Eretz, the land, all you humble of the land, what should you do? Respond. And Jesus shows up with the same message in the New Testament. Who's blessed? Who has today claims, rightful claims to the future blessing? Who's blessed? He tells us the lowly verse 5 of Matthew chapter 5. Why? Because they shall inherit the gase, the land the earth. The same land that was promised is inherited by the humble or lowly. So Jesus, the ultimate prophet, shows up with the same message as the lesser prophets of the Old Testament. Be humble and inherit the land. Be humble 
and experience the blessings that are coming in the kingdom. This is the message of Zephaniah. What does that have to do for, for us today? I mean, hopefully it's already obvious. <laughs> the universal destruction that was predicted has not come. So it's even nearer than it was to Zephaniah. And from God's perspective, when God told Zephaniah it was near, that's not him turning a phrase or uh, being deceptive. It's near, but it's really a long way away. No, from God's perspective, it's near. It's near. And we are in the last days, the New Testament authors say. And so the day is even nearer. So the instructions equally and maybe even more so apply. If you live, members of Grace Bible Church, visitors here tonight, if you live with divided allegiances, you seek practically to serve God and other things, then you must heed these, these warnings. You must flee to Christ. Rid, rid yourself, plead with God that he would give you an undivided heart for him so that you will know for sure that you will inherit the kingdom. Do you follow him? Do you worship Christ fully, unashamedly? Does he have your heart? You know he has your heart if he has your obedience, if he has your submission. Not perfect. Anyone says he's without sin, he's a liar and the truth is not in him. We're not talking about perfection. We're talking about sincerity, faithfulness. This is a call for, for you, for me. And beyond that, I want to just briefly give us three other arenas, three other ways that Zephaniah's message is relevant in the here and now. We've got so much happening uh, and, and changes coming at a blinding speed coming at us daily from what's happening currently in the Middle East and the war between Israel and Palestine and then in our own country, the social justice movement attacks coming from within the church, coming outside of the church, at the church, uh, in society, attacks on the family, attacks on masculinity, you know, under this, this new wave, this new movement that's supposed to be about equity and justice, not anything of, of true equity and justice, but it uses the language. What does Zephaniah have to say to us? Zephaniah is immensely helpful because it reminds us of, of three things. God's superior justice, God's superior salvation, and God's superior kingdom. God's superior justice, salvation, and kingdom. If you, if you listen long enough, read widely enough, then you, you know, and even if you don't do those things, you're berated with it constantly, almost for sure. The, the woke movement, the social justice movement, it, it's a package deal. It is a package deal. It, it is a complete worldview, which is why some are finding out, some believers are finding out that train that you jumped on in 2015, it doesn't stop. It hasn't gone far enough. And so some Christians are throwing the flag and it's too late. You've already capitulated and told them that you need minorities to interpret your Bible for you. That scripture's not clear enough. That you need minority voices 
as leaders in the church. And you need to diversify your church leadership with women and other oppressed groups and that kind of nonsense. And, and where does that stop? It, it doesn't. You can't ever become not, you know, you can't ever be anti-racist enough, we're learning. And so every grievance has a platform. Everything that goes under the banner gets labeled justice, gains legitimacy. And people who have not held to the scriptures faithfully are finding themselves floundering, grasping for answers. How do we say, okay, that's enough? You can't. Only by returning to the scriptures in full, and I think Zephaniah is helpful to do that, do you have a sufficient answer? And so I just want to just briefly give us um, some, some general insights into the way I think Zephaniah combats these wrong ideas in our day. First, just think about God's superior justice, how it's outlined in Zephaniah. What does woke justice say? Woke justice actually removes, it excuses wrongdoing from this or that oppressed class and finds fault in those who have power or in a majority class. That's not justice. That's not justice. But what does God's justice tell us? Look again at chapter one. God's superior justice is the kind of justice that is impartial. It's impartial toward the wicked. It doesn't care if you're a Jew or a Gentile. It doesn't care if you're a man or a woman, old or young, a minority or the majority ethnicity in a place. It doesn't matter. When God's justice arrives, what's happening? A complete end to all things. There's no distinction about which men and which beasts or birds or fish. It's all getting caught up together in the justice of God when the day of the Lord arrives. The wrath of God applies across the board. So this is to the world generally. It's impartial justice. And it's against the Jews particularly. Just notice the people group that gets called out most, verse 4, Judah, Jerusalem, this place. So not only is the entire world of sinners accountable before God, but the, the people who receive the most revelation, who had the prophets specifically sent to them, who had the history and the covenants and the promises given, are most accountable. To whom much is given, much is required. And so God's superior justice is, yes, against the world generally and against the Jews particularly. Notice the same is true when it comes to the superiority of God's salvation. In the woke movement, you got to be black to be saved, or you got to be a part of some oppressed class to experience their version of salvation, right? If you want to have your sins absolved, if you want to be cleared of any wrongdoing, and have that kind of pardon, you got to be a part of the right group, the right ethnicity, the right class. It's not, that's not real salvation. That's not a just salvation. That's actually bondage, not rescue. But what, is, what makes God's salvation superior? I think Zephaniah again gives us insight. God's superior salvation is, again, we'll notice, for the Jews especially and for the nations too. For the Jews especially and for the nations too. Go back to chapter 2. 
This was already, we already saw this addressed to the humble of the earth, speaking, I think, specifically to the, the territory of, of Judah, that portion of the earth or that land. It could be, it could be translated. But then notice in verse uh, 11, when, when the nations are in view, it says Yahweh will be fearsome to them, for he will starve all the gods of the earth and all the coastlands of the nations. Not just the nation Israel, but the nations plural. They will do what? They'll bow down to him, everyone from his own place. So even as the, the kingdom is established, Around the world, God will receive worldwide worship. Every extremity to where the judgment reached, so will God have his name adored and worshiped. This was the promise to the Messiah in Psalm 2, by the way. Just listen at Psalm 2. Verse 7, I will surely tell of the decree of Yahweh. Yahweh said to me, this is the Messiah speaking firsthand, first person. The Messiah, the Yahweh said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, Yahweh says to him, and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance and the ends of the earth as your possession. Jesus will lay claim to worldwide worship. Not just one nation. No, he's too great a king to only have, his, have the allegiance to have the hearts of one nation. He wants them all, and he will have them all. The woke movement is so petty and small and stupid, it would lay claim to just one nation. Well, you can have that God. The God of the scriptures is worthy of worldwide worship. This is sort of, you know, the the Jews especially, the nations too. There's a priority, but God has the right to prioritize in whatever way he wants. He can save someone before another, prioritize a nation over another, set a person, as we saw this morning, Zerubbabel, over others at his own will because he's chosen to. He's sovereign. That's what it means to be king. You can do what you want. And so the salvation, God's superior salvation is for the Jews especially. Paul, Paul echoes this. The New Testament writers echo this. Uh, Jesus came in, in Matthew Uh, said to Gentiles, what? It's not right to give what belongs to the children to the dogs. He came for the Jews. And his specific coming, his ministry, was among the Jews. He didn't come at that time for the Gentiles. But when he leaves, what does he say? Go to the ethnos, the, the, the ethne, the nations, right? His commission is certainly to go out and preach the gospel, disciple nations, but when he was on earth, didn't go outside of maybe 200 miles from where he was born. That was his ministry. That was his mission when he, when he walked the earth. And so he prioritized the Jews, but his salvation extends far beyond. And then just finally, not only God's superior justice is in view in Zephaniah, not only God's superior salvation is in view in Zephaniah, but God's superior kingdom. And that brings us to chapter 3. The, the social justice movement of our day would have its kingdom right now. They want their kingdom. They want their power today. And that too is too small. This kingdom is worth waiting for. So the timing's future. It's superior even in its timing. It's worth waiting for. It's coming. And even in not only its timing, but its source. This kingdom 
is so superior, no man can bring it about. I don't care what the post-millennialists say. It's just not how it's happening. God, only God can usher in his kingdom. It will be glorious. He only alone has the power to bring it about. Why would we want it any other way? Do you really want to live in a kingdom you can build? Don't invite me. <laughs> no thanks. The, this kingdom, only God can bring it about. And to make sure that everybody who was looking forward to it inherits it, he's going to accomplish a resurrection for it. That's the kingdom that I want to be a part of. That's the kingdom that you want to be a part of. And then finally, it is just remarkable to note the difference between the citizens of God's kingdom and the kingdom that the woke movement would establish. What kind of citizens belong to God's kingdom? Let me just give you a list. According to verses 1 through 3 that we've already read in chapter 2, these are believing people. Because they believed, if they believed Zephaniah, they did what Zephaniah said. So implicitly, this is a believing people. They believe God. They are worshipers of God. They are just people. Chapter 2, verse 3 says, Seek Yahweh, all you humble of the earth, who have worked his justice, or who do work his justice. Oh, Real justice? Yeah, real justice. Christians, believers, Old Testament saints, future tribulation saints who actually do what God calls just. They are believing, they are worshipers, they are just, they are, verse 3, righteous, they seek righteousness, and they are humble people. Humble people. Chapter 3, verse 9. When this day comes, God says, I will change them to peoples, that's peoples, plural, and again, n- numerous nations, with what? Purified lips. So they're a pure people. The most difficult part of you to control, your mouth, James says, is perfect when this day comes because of God's change wrought in them. So they're a pure people. Uh, The change language implies conversion has taken place. God's the one who does the transformation. Verse 11 in chapter 3, In that day you will feel no shame. They are an unashamed people. Because he's removed the arrogant, haughty ones from among them. Verse 11, your proud, exalting ones. And you will never again be haughty on my holy mountain. They're they're an unashamed people. They're also, verse 9, a unified people because they call on the name of Yahweh and serve him. That's worship language. How do they do it? Shoulder to shoulder. In perfect unison. Jesus, the king, is the conductor, and like a well-trained orchestra, everybody moves in perfect unison as they serve him. Verse 13, there are truthful people. The remnant of, of Israel will do no injustice. They will speak no falsehood. They will not speak falsehood, nor will a deceitful tongue be found in their mouths. So there are truthful people. Verse 14, They're a happy people. That's another way of just saying they're blessed. Happy, truly happy, eternally happy, because they do what? Sing for joy, make a loud shout, they be glad and exult with all their hearts. All the nations will do this with Israel, Israel being the specific people in view. They're a happy people. And then finally, it's worth noting in verse 15, praise God, they are a safe people. Yahweh has taken away his judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The king of Israel, Yahweh is in your midst. You will fear evil no more. 
In that day it will be said to Jerusalem, do not fear, O Zion. Do not let your hands fall limp. Yahweh your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will be joyful over you with gladness. He will be quiet or will quiet you, I think, in his love. He will rejoice over you with joyful singing. I mean, what a day worth waiting for. And God's people will forever be safe because their king and savior is a mighty warrior forever with them. This just isn't what we see among the kingdoms of men, is it not? Not believing, idolaters, unjust, unrighteous, proud, impure, unconverted, shameful, disunified, deceptive, depressed people. (laughs) They're not even safe with the woke movement. They're defund the police, you know, motto. The, the kingdom of men is completely different than the one that God's bringing. And so this is instructive for us, not only in uh, an apologetic sense that we get to look at what's happening around us and say, you know, this isn't, this isn't what God intends. We have something better coming. But it's also instructive to us to actually live the kind of life, to be the kind of people who do inherit that kingdom. Be a people of faith. Be a faithful people. And so let's live and pray to that end. God, thank you for uh, such marvelous truths, even as the world spins out of control around us. We know it's not out of your control. Uh, We may not know uh, what to do. We may have our plans frustrated and come to an end. But this is why we don't put our hope in these things, God. We look forward to an unshakable kingdom, realities that will not be removed, an inheritance that can't be taken away, treasures that can't be destroyed. And so, God, help us to live with confidence in light of that coming day, to store up treasures in heaven, to have our priorities in order and to be willing to forsake all for the sake of fearing you, obeying you, as we eagerly await the the kingdom to come. And we ask for all these things, not for our own comfort, not for our own glory, but so that Christ would be magnified as he deserves. Amen.